Good morning, welcome to Duncan Road Church Online. It is great to have you with us. A newspaper on one occasion ran a competition asking people to describe friends, friendship. These are some of the answers that people wrote in. One person wrote, one who multiplies joys, divides grief, and whose honesty is invaluable. Someone else wrote, one who understands our silence. Someone else wrote, a friend is a volume of sympathy, bound in cloth. And one other person uh, penned these words, a watch that beats true for all time and never runs down. The winning entry was this one. A friend is one who comes in when the whole world has gone out. Well, that's a good answer. And today we're looking at a friendship, or rather Paul's prayer for his friends, as found in the book of Colossians and chapter 1. Colin Dyer is our guest speaker, as well as Colin uh, talking to the adults and the children. We've got some great hymns and songs of worship, so we're glad you can join with us, and we trust God will bless us all, each one.
Lord, thank you that we can declare publicly and unite our voices in the true fact that your love endures forever. Lord, our love is so transient. It's uh, strong one day and it's weak the next. Sometimes we're quite particular as to who are the recipients of our love. But thank you that your love is constant. Your love is for all people. We know in that psalm that when your enemies fought against your people, then they were punished. And, uh, but Lord, you punish them with a sadness in your heart, for you are a loving God, a father of all creation, one who desires that none should perish. Your word makes that so clear, but you want all to come to a knowledge of you. Thank you, Lord, for that time in our own experience when our eyes were opened and we saw more than just print on a page. We heard more than just tunes from musical instruments. We understood the meaning of those hymns and songs. We understood the message from that printed page. They brought us into contact with the living God, the one who has revealed himself through the word and in his son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for that time in our own experience when our eyes were spiritually opened and our hearts were touched and we moved from darkness to light. Lord, thank you that we no longer just talk about a God of love. We've experienced that love in our own hearts. And your word says you have lavished your love upon us. And Lord, may we be ever grateful for such love. Your word tells us that God so loved the world And Lord, thank you that you're a God of action, not just words. You proved your love in giving, in sending your one and only Son, so that none of us need perish, but all could come to eternal, to everlasting life. So Lord, thank you for this tremendous truth, we pray. Thank you for the freedom we're still allowed in this country to meet together. And although perhaps the restrictions hinder us, they don't uh, take away um, our praise, our worship of you this morning. May we sense your presence with us and may all that is said and done be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. For absent friends, we're aware of those who are having to self-isolate. We ask that they might know your presence. We pray especially for those struggling with health. A number in the fellowship need our prayers. We pray, Lord, that you will strengthen them, that you might heal their bodies and bring them back to good uh, a good position where they can uh, perhaps enjoy life in a, a more comfortable way than the struggles of the moment. So bless them and heal them, we pray, as we commit our loved ones to you. And we bring our thanksgiving in and through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Si me dejas 
deixarei os pais e amigos. Right, good morning everybody. It's uh, um, a privilege for me to be here to actually speak to people. And the church I come from isn't back to meeting together yet. So uh, this is the first time I'm not preaching to a screen. And, uh, and you'll all look so much better you. with masks. So that's also a benefit. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, hidden things. So if we could bring up the PowerPoint, that would be great. Um, hidden things, there are many things that we simply do not know about because they are hidden. Perhaps no one has told us about them, or maybe we've never looked carefully. Um, there are hidden things all over the place. Oh, I've gone backwards, haven't I? I should have gone forward there. There are hidden things all over the place. I was in Cornwall recently. Yeah, thank you very much. I was in Cornwall recently, and you'll find caves like that in Cornwall. And uh, that one, if you bothered to investigate it, you would discover contains a bathroom. They've um, actually constructed a seat in there. This is in Victorian time. There's even a skylight and a little pool for you to privately bathe in. But you'd never know it was there if you didn't go looking for it. There's all sorts of things that are hidden that we know nothing about. And some secrets are unknown, and but we need to know about them. And some secrets that people need to know will actually save lives. Wow, and they're significant things. But how are we to know secrets? Because some things really do need to be known. And how is that going to actually happen? How are they going to be made known? Well, if you're sitting there thinking, I wonder how secrets could be made known. Well, it usually needs a messenger or messengers for that matter. Messengers to be sent so that secrets that are unknown might be revealed to those who need to know them. But who's going to go and bring those messages, those secrets, and make them known to people like us? Well, we do need to know them because people will be saved by them, but messengers need to be sent. And the ones that I'm thinking of today are really weak messengers. They're not supers. They're not Incredibles, boys and girls. You probably know about the Incredibles, do you? From the telly, from Disney or Pixar. You're all looking blank. Well, you've been very polite this morning. They're not Incredibles, but they're vulnerable. Ones that can be injured. Ones that can be killed. And they will bring the messages that make the secrets known. And as a consequence of that, it will make possible lives being saved. In fact, the message is actually part of them. And to make sure the message get through to those who need to hear this so that lives will be saved, it will require many messengers. Many messengers, because there are many dangers. Now, there will be natural dangers. There will be forces at work to stop them. Men 
and women who violently will try to stop every messenger from getting through. And they'll use guns and uh, birds to stop them from arriving at their destination. And even though some will be injured and some will be killed and some will just plain get lost and never arrive, still the messengers are sent. Now the big question is, as we sit here this morning, who are those messengers? Boys and girls, have you any idea who a messenger might be, and there's lots of them, who has a message that's a part of them and yet they're quite weak and could be easily killed or injured any ideas adults have you any ideas or it could be any of the prophet no I wasn't I wasn't being half as spiritual as that I'll give you a little hint boys and girls who do you think who do you think the messengers might be who are going to have a message as a part of them and bring it to those who need to know it what is it? A pigeon, yes. And this pigeon is going to go from where the secrets are hidden all the way over to those who need to know them. We're thinking of COVID. You've just seen a bird flu there, as it were. But yes, the, these are pigeons. And I'm thinking way back to the Second World War where in Belgium they hid pigeons and tied the message to their little legs and set them free, and then they had to fly all the way to England. When Germans were trying to shoot them, when they sent up birds of prey to try and snatch them out of the air, when storms caused them sometimes to lose their way or lose their strength, the messengers were continually sent. Pigeons are the messengers, and with bravery, skill, and hard work, the messengers did get through. And the secrets that were unknown are made known. Only one in ten, it's reckoned, of those messengers ever got through. It was really costly. But lives were saved by the ones that arrived. And if you're thinking, why are you spending all this time, Colin, speaking about pigeons? Well, it's because God has sent us messengers. He has sent us messages so that things that are hidden, mysteries that have been hidden for ages and for generations, might be revealed. Jesus had this to say to us, How are you escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore I am sending you, Colin, this is where you come in, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes, fragile people. And Jesus said, some of them you will kill, some of them you will flog and persecute from town to town. Today, those who bring the message of God to people who have not heard it are very often opposed. But the most important messenger was so much more than those pigeons. The messenger, we are told, became flesh and lived for a while amongst us. He took on such a vulnerable and fragile existence in order that he might reveal God in the flesh amongst us. And just as Jesus taught, so it happened to him. People flogged him, persecuted him, and eventually killed him. But we are told that in these last days he has spoken to us by his son. And that means that for every one of us here who's come to know him through uh, the rebirth that God brings and through faith in who he is, that we actually are witnesses to who he is and have a message also to pass on. Why? As we thought before, so that lives will be saved. And we have a responsibility here, don't we? There's a few of us here, but what we hear today needs to be known by the thousands that live around us, who if the message doesn't get through, will not be saved. Thank you. 
people on super brave superheroes. They don't have nurses from their heads to their toes. They're not gladiators at sea to the sea. In fact, it's amazing. They are just like you and me. Sometimes scared, sometimes scared. Shaking and shivering. But let's realize we got God on our side. They don't have mercies from their head to their toes They're not gladiators at sea to the sea In fact, it's amazing They are just like you and me Lots of people aren't super brave superheroes They don't have mercies from their head to their toes They're not gladiators at sea to the sea in fact, it's amazing They are just like you and me Sometimes scared Shaking and shivering But let's be alive We've got God on our side And He can do absolutely anything Are you ready? Last time, God's people God's people aren't super brave superheroes They don't Nurses from their head to their toes They're not gladiators at sea to the sea In fact, it's amazing They are just like you and me There are people all over the world living without a Bible of their own and desperate to read God's Word. And thanks to you, our fundraising heroes, in the last year we've printed nearly 1.3 million affordable Bibles in China alone. In sub-Saharan Africa, we've run Bible-based literacy classes and supported 14 different Bible translations, making God's Word available to whole communities. We've distributed over 200,000 scripture portions to our brothers and sisters in the Middle East and provided Bible-based trauma healing to those in need. More locally, our work across England and Wales aims to increase Bible confidence among Christians, as well as changing the conversation about the Bible in wider society. Every penny you raise will help offer the Bible to the world. Together, we can share the good news. The youth edition of the Good News Bible, the Bible course, and our ever-growing Open the Book project are all examples of how your fundraising efforts have had a real impact on our mission. Thank you. You are amazing. We're so excited for the next year and we can't wait to see how your support will impact Bible Society in 2020. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, 
our dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. song into my hearts. Jesus put this song into my hearts. It's a song of joy no one can take away. Jesus put this song into Here, uh, we've entitled this uh, Asking God for Our Friends or Praying for Others. Let me just say a couple of things because we started reading from Colossians 1. Um, in it, he says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father. Now, that is a common greeting in Paul's letters, but bear in mind when he says grace and peace to you, what does that in fact mean? Well, I think it means actually that the rest of this letter is the way by which God conveys his rich generosity and conveys by his spirit and through these words a peace in the midst of all the ups and downs and situations of life. It is not just a sort of, oh, uh, how are you at the beginning of a letter. It is actually saying what this letter will convey and bring to the people that hear it and what it will bring to us. That's why we pay attention to these words because through them, the grace of God and the peace of God come. Just another thing to notice is we often call this Paul's letters to the Colossians, 
But if you'll notice right at the beginning, it says Paul and Timothy, and they will speak as a we through this letter. So I'm going to take that seriously, that this is actually written by Paul and Timothy to the people of Colossae, and we'll come to where that is in a minute. But let me just start off by talking about growth. Growth is a a significant and important thing, isn't it? Those of you over this current period have perhaps had more time to try and grow things than you normally would have done, taken more interest in that. And when you've planted the seeds, you have wanted to see some fruit or flowers from your efforts. And growth is very much a facet of what is being talked about in the first part of this letter. And and growth is something Jesus spoke to us about. He said the kingdom of God is like a man who scatters seed on the ground and night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he doesn't know how. And by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, and then the full kernel in the head. And as soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. And there he is talking about the impact, the effect of what the message of God will have in the world. And he describes it like a seed. Now seeds are remarkable things, aren't they? I've put up three of the ones that I particularly like. You've got the helicopter whirring sycamore um, seeds. You've got the almost like a pepper pot poppy seeds where in the wind that blows it shakes the seeds out those little holes. And you've got the good old dandelion that you children should know because you pick them up, don't you, and blow them around. And that's really good fun, isn't it? Yeah, some of you are smiling. It is good fun. Seeds are remarkable things. You can put these little brown specks into the ground and a few weeks later you can be pulling up something that's completely different colour and shape and once you've washed it, you could either eat it as it is or cook it and serve it up with your roast dinner if you have such a thing. Isn't that incredible? All from that tiny speck that doesn't look much different to some dirt. They're remarkable things. Even conkers you can find grow because they're seeds just as you see in the picture there. And Jesus says that there's a great mystery in the growth of the seed. I doubt if most of you here know how a seed germinates and grows and produces the wonderful things that it does from that tiny little container of information and yet it does. And whether we get up or go to bed, the seeds grow. And the seed of God's word, the message, the mystery that has been made known has sprouted in Colossae. And there's several words in there that bear witness to that about it bearing fruit and increasing. It has borne fruit. And this has happened as a consequence of someone sowing seed. And it's a bit of a mystery and a miracle what has happened in Colossae as it, it happens anywhere in the world. We find from this letter that the person who sowed the seed in Colossae is down there in verse 7. You learned it, he said, from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. And in fact, it's it's he who has spoken to Paul and Timothy and told them about what has gone on there. Epaphras scattered the seed. Boys and girls, if you've ever scattered seed and adults, you'll know that some of it's lost and some of it is snared by, by weeds Some of it, perhaps the birds nick, but eventually there's a harvest, and it's been like that in Colossae. Epaphras has scattered the seed. He scattered it in a place called Colossae. It's about 100 miles east of Ephesus. In fact, you'll find some similarity between the two letters. And Paul has spoken in the past about how this sort of growth goes, uh, takes place. He describes this in the book of Corinthians. He says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. 
So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. Just like the miracle of how a carrot seed produces a carrot, so the message of what God is doing in Jesus Christ makes, brings life and makes things grow. It's God who has been making it grow in that place. Paul the planter, Apollos watered it, but it's God who's made it grow. And therefore there's strong implication in this passage and from what we're listening to there that the main thing that is required for the gospel, as it were, to take root in people's lives is for God to be at work in mighty power to bring it about. So, therefore, we must rely on God to make things grow. I don't know if you pray over your plants. Uh, my mum used to pray for parking spaces whenever she drove somewhere because she was a nervous driver. I don't know if you've prayed over your plants. But you most definitely need to pray for the gospel to bear fruit because we depend on God to make it happen. I will be clear here, we, it does not depend upon prayer. Prayer by itself is useless unless God answers it. We depend upon God and therefore we go to the source of life to ask him that the gospel might grow in the lives of people. And Paul and Timothy rely on God by praying for growth. That's my first point here, or part of the first point. Because what, have, what he's already done in their lives um, has produced fruit already. Verse 4 your faith in Christ Jesus, the love that you have for all the saints. These things are already things that are happening in this town. And now, because they're looking for God to act, they're asking him to cause that to grow. And from the first day that they heard about what was going on in Colossae, right up until they got news from Epaphras, they are clear they have not stopped um, praying. Verse 4, since we heard of your faith and of your love, um, uh, they have been praying and they continue to talk about that in verse 9. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. Now, where did this come from? Some of you might be sitting there and oh, flipping it, you know, that continual, persistent praying, that's not something that I have. I mean, they must have had some sort of inner discipline. Well, perhaps they did. Does it come from a love for these people? Well, Paul had never actually been to Colossae, never actually went there as far as we know. So these are strangers. He's certainly not met them. Uh, he may have a love for them, but it's not a love born of, out of first-hand contact with them. And so this type of praying is not so much about an inner discipline or even necessarily from knowing them and responding to who they are. It's not about them placing their burdens on God's heart, but God placing his burdens on their hearts. That's why Timothy and Paul pray and continue to pray and persist in prayer. And the terms of asking in here suggest an urgent asking, almost a demanding, because God is the source of the growth in the life of the believers, the Christians in Colossae, as it is the source of life for us. Secondly, uh, they ask God for more, um, which as soon as I say it, some of your minds will have gone to uh, Oliver Twist. Please, sir, can I have more? Um, I, this illustration may not fit completely with this story, but having tasted some of what he'd been given already, he wanted more of what he'd been given already. And the people in Colossae have already tasted something of the goodness of the Lord, and there's fruit of that, and spiritual life as a consequence of that. And now... Timothy and Paul are asking for more. There is a place for greediness in the Christian life. It's a desire for more of what God might give. And so they ask God for that. 
This praying is not about maintaining the status quo. It's about them growing up. It's about them being filled with the knowledge of the will of God. It's about them um, being filled with understanding, verse 9. This, therefore, is about change and development shaped by the mercies of God. They ask God to work in people they've never known and who they've never met. Now, isn't that remarkable? Because most of our prayers probably, and I'm making an assumption because I don't know you, are often for our family, people we know, people that are close to us. And we find it really difficult or sometimes we just forget everybody else that we don't know or bump into in, in life. We don't often include them in our requests to God. I suggest that praying for those we don't know, as Paul and Timothy are doing, requires a certain self-denial. It requires considering others more important than ourselves, which is actually a quality demonstrated by God in the giving of his Son. God didn't, in the three persons that he is, remain where he was in heaven but what he did was to send um, the Son into this world to a people who did not know him, to a people who were distant to him, and in fact enemies in their hearts. He came for them and for us so that he could bring about life in us, spiritual life, that would change the present and the future for everyone who turned to Christ and followed him. They ask God to work in people they've never known and that means that you and I can ask God for people that we've never known or seen or met. And I think that's encouraging. And you may have prayed for refugees in Syria. And you'd have warrant to pray for refugees in Syria because that's what Paul and Timothy are doing. You might pray for a Christian teacher out in Indonesia that you happen to know or a teacher somewhere else in the world who is active amongst school kids or you might pray for an organisation. And even though you may not personally have been involved with any of them, you have a Father in heaven who is able over space and time to intervene and to produce growth in the far-flung corners of the earth. So pray for them as Paul is doing here with some personal knowledge from Epaphras. We can pray for those who are not us and not me. And if God lays a burden on our hearts for a specific people or a person or an organization or a situation, that burden will cause us to pray. Now, I have a friend, and I don't very often see him, but he prayed consistently for Michael Jackson. Some of you might think, why would you Pray for Michael Jackson. Didn't he sing well enough as it was and dance? You know, he wasn't praying for that. But he prayed consistently for him. He never met the guy, but he prayed. Well, I don't know if the prayer was answered. Find out one day. We don't know what happened in the last moments of that man, but he prayed for him. Some people I know from the little correspondence I have for them give me a sense that they pray for me consistently. It surprises me. And when I do meet them, which is not very often, I have an even greater awareness that I have been on their hearts. That could only have come from God because I'm not you know, the most notable of person that you'd want to pray for, but it happens. And, and there will be people who have been praying for you. And I ask this question, how much in my life and in your lives has been remarkably affected and changed because God has been answering the prayers of many that maybe you don't even know about, who maybe met you once and you lodged in their mind and they've continued to pray for you and your growth and your development, maybe your coming to faith in Jesus has been as the Father has answered the requests of those people. And therefore perhaps we need to be burdened more for each other. Maybe this time of lockdown helps us with that. But prayers for others is not just about saying a prayer, but entreating God to be active and involved in that person's life. I take an interest uh, in a guy who produces comics. 
um, this is the word for word Bible comic. It includes every single word of the NIV on Matthew's Gospel and illustrated profusely right the way through it. He wrote in uh, his blog, prayer is such an important element in this project and we'd love you to continue asking the Lord to guide us and help us make the right creative choices. Do you notice there, asking the Lord. Remember that, prayer is not just about prayer, it's about asking the Lord to guide us and help us. He relies on God for direction and for creative fruit from that project. Right, let's just move on to the third point. Paul and Timothy have a wish list. Uh, do any of you have a wish list? I have a birthday coming up soon. Uh, I need to write a wish list because when you're my age, you've usually bought everything that you want yourself. Um, but I do have a wish list and they have a wish list. And they, you'll find that uh, in your text there. I've highlighted it so that you can see it. Um, it's on the second page of it. Uh, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will. And this comes first on his list. This is not his personal list. This is his list of what he believes God wants to do for these people. He wants them to know God's will, to hear it, to be shaped by it. And as they hear this letter read to them, um, he's asking that their knowledge of God will result in real experiential wisdom, an understanding of how to act and speak in the various situations that they are in. A knowledge that comes from the spirit. Some uh, translate um, spiritual understanding. But it comes from the spirit of God. Specifically from him, from his word, from his son. And we still need to ask God that our friends and the people we know will be filled with the knowledge of his will. So that they'll know the difference between going to the right and to the left. And that they will not live as foolish people. So we continually ask God for this, he says. And uh, he also, uh, there we are, there's those verses, uh, they pray with a purpose in mind. Verse 10, we continually ask God, verse 9, so that, I have a friend who often prays, uh, will you bless this person, will you bless that person, will you bless the other person? And I'm not critiquing him because I do believe he seriously prays for people but sometimes I say to him what is the blessing you want them to have because you want God to bless them how do you want him to bless them what do you want him to do in your life I mean if I ask for something or you ask for something you have a purpose don't you a so that they're worth looking out for and there's more than one so that in this verse well he asks that they have the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding so that they may live a life worthy of the Lord one that imitates Jesus one that displays his character one that helps, enables them to become a part of his purposes, not just doing their own thing. And he continues, doesn't he? That you may please them in every way. Walk in a way worthy of the Lord. Lives lives fully pleasing to him. I uh, have uh, one of my sons went to university. Um, I don't like university, to be honest. But... Uh, he didn't live a life fully pleasing to him and uh, he would accept that. His testimony proclaimed that very, very clearly. And uh, I'm not sure that I asked God on his behalf specifically for that. And you can flesh that out, couldn't you? That he would live a life fully pleasing by not getting caught up with all the girls, not getting caught up with the parties and the nightlife and the drinking. Um, not that drinking in itself is wrong, but what it leads to. You can flesh that out. Bear fruit in every good work, increase in the knowledge of God. May the three years, I'm just using this as an illustration of my son, he hopefully won't see this uh, recording, um, but in, over this period may it be a time of real spiritual growth that he would not just simply know who God is, but know what it means to live for God in that situation. And sometimes we need to write these things down be a little bit detailed about what we're looking for. Um, these are things that we're not dreaming up, but we're garnering from Paul, and they, have, uh, they come from God himself, what he wants to do in our lives. 
Um, he wants us to be more patient, to have greater kindness, to have a special thoughtfulness. And, and uh, we can pray for those things. They pray for these things. Bearing fruit in every good work, that's another thing he prays for, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power. Verse 11, according to his glorious might. This is very similar to Ephesians. The power that God is at work in his children is the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. We're told that in Ephesians chapter 1. And so we, he is praying that these people are strengthened with the resurrection power of God that brings life out of uh, death, that brings light out of darkness. Because these people have been delivered, the last verses tell us, or transferred from the kingdom of darkness and brought into the inheritance of the saints in light. And so he prays for this. Now there's perhaps quite a lot to think about in all of those. Um, But it is fleshed out later on in the book. The knowledge of God's will involves getting rid of certain things. Now, you're very fortunate today that I chose not to wear these shirts and take them off publicly in front of you. Um, If you want to watch a video of me doing that, well, I don't know why, but you can find it on our website. But he goes on to say, you know, when it comes to knowing God, it's not just about being saved for heaven. It is about being rescued now from sin in increasing measure. And so he then begins to spell that out. Get rid of sexual immorality, impurity, lust. Take it off. That's not the clothing for you to wear out in public or in private for that matter. To get rid of anger, rage, malice. Is that your problem? Well, he is praying that they be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. So don't say, well, that's just how I am. Because if the Spirit of God is in you, if you've come to faith in Christ, if I have come to faith in Christ, then these things uh, we have been given the power to get rid of and to take them off. Slander, filthy language, lying. I love the fact that what we could think the knowledge of God's will is just something Uh, academic or mental or in the mind to see that it's fleshed out in ordinary everyday life the two are connected it is not um, you come become a, a Christian and then later on you accept him as Lord he is Lord and Savior and that is to be seen in the way we conduct ourselves today today and then he says put on humility I've never read any, have you ever seen a job advert asking for someone, we want someone clothed in humility, or words to that effect. Or we would look, we're looking for a gentle co-worker to join our team. But these are things that are essential for us as believers, compassion and kindness. And over all these virtues, he says in uh, chapter 3, uh, put on love. That could be a belt that ties it all together, it could be a shirt as I've put there that goes over them all. Now this is a lot to think about but being strengthened here is not about as we were talking earlier about using muscles or going to the gym it's not about steroids it's coming from God who gives growth and the power that he wants to strengthen us with And this trust that sometimes when we're praying for someone we love or someone we don't know and we're not seeing the results of what we're asking for, trust persists in continuing to ask the Father for that person. Knowing that actually we can't change another person, but with the Father himself can change anyone that he sets his love upon. And small steps in getting rid of these things and putting them on is often the way that God works in us. Bit by bit by bit, small steps. Those are the things uh, that he asks for. And you've got them on the sheet so you could ponder them perhaps later and think about how that might shape your request to God. And finally this morning, the soil in which this praying happens is the soil of thankfulness. The soil of thankfulness. Verse 3, he started off by saying, we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. We always thank. And then we could go down uh, towards 
uh, the bottom of this passage uh, to verse, second, uh, verse 12, giving joyful thanks to the Father who's qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light because he has rescued us. We're no longer a part of that old way of life we have been brought into the kingdom of the Son that God loves, in whom we have forgiveness, in whom we have been bought through the death of Jesus Christ himself for us. And in that situation, in that deep gratefulness for what God has done for us, should arise our burden and our prayers for others. Dear Lord, our God and Father, help us, not only now, but in this week, to meditate on what we would love to see you doing in the lives, not only of our family and friends and close associates, but what we'd love you to do in the lives of people we know about but actually don't know personally. And Lord, we thank you for the deep confidence that you gave Paul and Timothy to entreat you, to keep asking you, almost to demand from you that you'd work in these new believers and cause them to grow and know you better and bear fruit and that their lives would change by putting off the old ways and by putting on the, f the, the qualities that are a fruit of your spirit. And Lord, we ask, help us to pray for each other. Help us to ask for patience when we're frustrated with the current situation. Help us to pray for gentleness when we deal with others who are struggling at this time. And we ask too that you'd give us each a sense of our own inadequacy, as it were, and our need to mature and grow ourselves in ways that please you and imitate your Son. And Lord, we thank you that we have been able to meet today. Encourage us with your words, but may they be more than words. May they bear fruit in our lives, we ask, please. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh
Find a solace there.